right, the, um, the board is back in open session, and we uh, at this point are starting the Committee of the Whole meeting. Uh, at this point, is there any public comment? If there's no public comment, uh, does any board member have any proposed changes to the agenda? If there are no proposed changes, then we move right into the committee meeting. Uh, first up is finance. Uh, Rich? And actually, before finance, uh, oh, we're sorry. going to... Um, yeah, forgot. So this is sorry. our meeting that is typically at Central School. It is Mr. Gatz's night to welcome all of us. And uh, so... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, everybody, for welcoming me to the other side of campus tonight. But it's uh, a pretty typical thing. Uh, due to accessibility, we have the, the central presentation here at, at Hauser. So uh, thank you for having me. I just want to talk to you about a couple of things that are going on in my building as the year gets underway. Obviously, we're still settling in a little bit from the last minute additions, but um, the teachers have adjusted very well, and the staff is, is uh, welcoming of the new staff members, and we're getting things underway uh, very quickly and very smoothly. Um, one thing that we have going on, and partnering currently with the PTO, and they approached me about a week ago, and said, hey, we want to do some fundraiser uh, coming up uh, to support some of the disaster relief that's going on throughout the country. And they're going to choose a choose a, <clears throat> a, um, a charity to work with, either local or national, and to donate the money to. But they're looking for some ideas. And they came up with the idea of taping me to the wall with duct tape. <laughs> so they're going to be, they're going to be up. Uh, <laughs> selling strips of duct tape to take me to the wall and then we expanded the idea and I said well I don't want to do it myself and I said I, I would do it but I think we need to get some teachers involved so we're going to add some um, clear buckets that we're going to the PTO is going to man in the mornings before school and I have a select group of teachers whose faces will be on those buckets and the teacher who raises the most money in their jar might be Mr. Howes um, will be joining me taped to the wall so we'll see how that goes I, it's come, uh, that is that PTO determined. I know you're going to bring your paycheck, Merrill, to assure that I get taped to that wall. Um, so that's a, a partnership activity that's going to go on at school. I, the kids are going to be very excited about and the, the information will be going out to families very soon. Um, the, uh, there will be pictures and, and Wendy Doctors assured me she's going to get local media involved in it and I'm sure that will show up on TV. So we'll see what happens. Um, the second part is we've obviously have finished all our fall data meetings and we've identified some areas um, that we need to focus on within my building. And there was a, a larger than normal number of tier two kids in math in fourth grade in my building. So I got to talking and, and brainstormed a little bit with Merrill and uh, we decided that we're going to try something called cluster grouping within my fourth grade um, this year with math. And information will go to parents in the next couple of weeks. But what cluster grouping is, and first thing I'm going to clarify, it is not tracking. Uh, we assess the kids, all, all the kids in fourth grade at the beginning of each of the math units. Um, based on their identified skill deficits and needs, those students will be clustered across four tiers um, within the fourth grade. So within a classroom, there might be a group of uh, tier one kids and tier three kids and tier two kids and tier four kids in a different room. The idea behind it is, A, it allows the classroom teacher to focus on a smaller number of bands of kids within the room. Two, it targets individual student needs and allows us to focus instruction on those students' needs within the classroom. And three, as we always look to make sure that we're maximizing adult support throughout the building, it allows us to target the use of resource teachers, paraprofessionals, and the math interventionists within the building. Um, those kids are assessed to each unit. Kids move around. The groups change every single unit. Um, but they will still be using the core materials um, that we've been working with with the math and focus um, to, to make that process work. Um, so I'm very excited to see how that goes. And at some point during the year, I think we'll have some information to share back with you about um, how, how impactful it's been on student learning. But I I anticipate it to be a very successful process. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mr. Gass. That's very interesting. And I'm uh, glad to hear things are going well with the new teachers and all that. That's great. Um, any other questions or comments from Mr. Gass? Then we move right into uh, finance. Uh, Rich? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so since the last time we've met, um, Rob, Martha, and I have had a, actually a, a couple of really good productive meetings. Um, uh, so meetings that have gone very well, and I think we're going to see the, the progress and the fruits of those labors with um, Rob's report here uh, on the tax levy. So we can roll right into that, Rob. In the board packet, there was um, the first pass preliminary um, tax levy, and 
in the tax levy, it was a 2.74% increase. Um, I was do I did a conservative increase in the EAV of 4.79, which turns out to be very conservative, and of three million dollars worth of new property. And talking with um, Fran, or corresponding with Fran, she believes that the EAV will rise by 15 percent. Um, that's about the average. It will be about 15 percent. So that obviously makes this not very conservative. Um, and then also I learned a kind of a game changer where normally the Ed fund was capped at $3.50 and now there is no cap on it. So before where you could lose money in the Ed fund because it was capped and basically all the um, operating funds seem to be capped except for the transportation fund. So last year the, the district um, levied more in the transportation fund and then they did some resolution you did some resolutions to um, transfer the um, transfer transportation fund to the ed fund so basically on November 4th the um, school board did three resolutions the first was taking 3.5 million dollars loaning 3.5 million dollars to the transportation fund from the working cash fund once the transportation fund receives the 3.5 million, million in excess funds, it is to immediately pay back the loan. So that is part of the that was part of the budget to take 3.5 million from the transportation fund and repay, or from the education from the transportation fund and repay the working cash fund. Then there was another resolution to transfer 2.4 million dollars from the O and M or operation maintenance fund to the transportation fund. And the resolution said that the district has three years to pay back that. So then the transportation fund um, permanently transferred 8.3 million to the Ed Fund. So that's why we're going to have a large um, tax levy in the transportation fund so we can pay back the loan. But also because of the non-capped education fund, the district can levy more in the education fund and levy exactly for the other operating funds and then any excess ask the county clerk to reduce the education fund. So that's kind of the game changer. So now that way the district won't leave any money on the table, which it has in the past. Rob, I got a question for okay. you. In your conversation with, um, with Fran, she mentioned the increase in EAV but is that projected new property number, is that hers or is that a space holder until you have? It's a, That's why I asked. This is a reassessment year, it's triennial, so mm -hmm. there's been, um, she will make her assessment and then taxpayers can appeal that. So between the, the assessment and the, um, the appeals, it would be about 15%. I don't, that new property is not included, I'll have to find out what right. that new property will be. Okay. That's always a guess too. The EAV, you never know, and the new property, you never really know. But that three million is not a number from her? No, that was just, um, I kind of used the same as last time, just to make okay. sure. You want to be a little, you don't want to underestimate because right. then you leave, can lose some money on the table, so. Right, I was just wondering if she influenced that number at all. She did not. Okay. I, have not I have not talked to her about new property, but that's another conversation I'd like to have with her. Okay. So Rob, I assume you're going to then now, based on what you now know about mm -hmm. the cap being removed from the Ed Fund, which right. is actually wonderful news for, for us, um, given where we're at, are you, I assume you're going to go back and modify things a bit. Yes, it's going to be, look at, you know, yes, it, it's, a, it's a very fluid document and it's going to change a lot. Have you heard anything about whether the other funds are also uncapped? Because I guess from the language, it was a little bit unclear um, well, about what funds, whether it only applied to education. Yes, because it said for educational purposes and every that the interpretation from um, ARIS and other um, PMA and Cook County, the Cook County um, Clerk's Office is that it's the Ed Fund. Okay, restricted the Ed Fund. Mm -hmm. okay. 
So this document that Rob prepared is going to get modified a few times. It'll be updated. We actually don't have to approve it by school code until December. Um, but in the meantime, does anybody have any questions for anything that you've seen or read so far? Joel looks like he's ready to say something, so I don't want to hand it over just yet. Rob, can you go a little bit more into um, choosing those tax rates for the funds? Like, how, how do you, how are we choosing, for example, in, without, without looking at the game changer of the, un, the ed fund is uncapped, in this 2017 proposal, it shows the, that the ed fund and the operations and maintenance and special education and working cash and fire prevention were all going to be maximized. What was the goal in maximizing those funds? What because does that get you versus what we had before? Um, to maximize the funds as much as possible so that you, because you have various, um, like, operation maintenance needs, um, well, not the transportation, but um, for Social Security and IMRF, you have to pay those, those costs. So just basically to try to get the district the money where, where the expenses are going. So the goal is to put the money in the funds where it's right. been historically mm -hmm. needed versus having to do Trans fund, intra-fund transfers. Right. And then um, in the past, you wouldn't necessarily, you might ask, if the levy was at 98% and you had to reduce it by that 2%, you would sometimes you tell the county clerk where to take it and sometimes you might say well, let's take it from all funds at an equal proration mm -hmm. now with the ed fund being uncapped you tell you just tell the ed, you tell the county clerk just take it from the ed fund so that you know what you're probably going to get at the, the, those other funds previously where would we have told the county to take it from um or do you know you may you may not have that history i think it varied various years Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Rob? Great, thanks. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Rich. Um, was that it on financing? Is that That's everything. Mm -hmm. um, we next uh, move to education, Sure. Okay, we're gonna hear a tech report um, from Mr. Tufan, so come on up. I don't think he could hear you back Oh, here. sorry, I'm quiet. <laughs> you should be really team. quiet. Like, <laughs> sorry. It's Stop. a group presentation. Mr. <laughs> Tufano. Oh, I have Mr. Smith. And Cumberry, come on up. Yes, we have, um, I'm Don Tufano. <laughs> <laughs> we have Kelly King and then Jason Smith. Also, uh, all integral parts of the technology uh, department and the team. And uh, we're going to follow the same format as last year. Going to give a uh, kind of an overview of the departmental goals uh, and with a focus on uh, the instructional tech, the educational side. So I'm going to try to, won't try to whip through things, but, but move it along so we can focus on that for the, the sake of time. Uh, uh, we, uh, we're fortunate on the tech steering committee to have uh, two board members. Uh, so uh, uh, Dan Hunt and Dave Barsati have, have already seen this, uh, know the content. Uh, this is actually the third time I'm presenting it, so it should be pretty familiar with it. Um, okay, uh, so uh, as far as for planning and major initiatives for this year, um, I'm going to develop a five-year plan, five-year roadmap, which will include uh, all of our you know, any pro projected major initiatives, renewal cycles, so forth on equipment, along with uh, a budget to correspond with it. Um, <clears throat> this would take us through fiscal year 23. Uh, I could foresee that potentially in the, when we get into budget season, February, March, pres presenting maybe at the Finance Committee, if, if that were uh, so appropriate, to go over that, that plan. Um, but part of that plan is, is gonna be to look at uh, as di we've discussed previously, we have, we have some, some classroom-related technologies that are up for cycle, and what does that look like? So we want to evaluate 
possibly redefine and, and renew, identify what we're actually going to renew on this next purchasing cycle relative to those uh, resources uh, that have become the standard within our classrooms uh, and that teachers and students interact with. Uh, so that would be the classroom technologies uh, uh, that the teachers use. <clears throat> it may be impacted by the grade level or content area uh, that the technology would be appropriate for the, those purposes. I'm going to just look at the one-to-one -one program, not necessarily looking to make a change, but just get some feedback on, on the, the, the changes that we did make. So really think of it as a renewal in the direction that we're going. Um, uh, we do want to survey teachers, get their input as to what and how they use the classroom technologies, um, and, uh, and, and form a focus group. Uh, get a good cross-section, have begun really developing what that focus group, the consistency of it to make sure that we have good representation. Uh, and what that focus group would do is help to uh, evaluate that survey data, which we think would be really beneficial to have teachers involved in the evaluation of that data, the interpretation of that data, uh, as well as, as we start looking at those new technologies, really have a hands-on approach to what those new technologies are and see how they you know, get, their, get their feedback from those um, of those technologies. Um, but we also would look at incorporating into that all of our uh, remaining uh, core infrastructure projects, uh, our, you know, again, we already touched on the one-to-one -one, uh, program. Uh, and then ongoing replacement and upgrades, because really, once we get down to these classroom technologies, we have, we'll have gone through the process of evaluating every type of technology that we have in the district since uh, I came on board in 2014. Uh, those classroom technologies that we're reviewing, that we're reevaluating this year, those were all pretty much brand new or a year or two old when I had arrived. So now we're evaluating that, and that will help us to really be able to map out that next five years and what that looks like. Uh, this year we also have, as part of the existing budget, uh, we're going to be upgrading our UPSs. That will increase our, uh, uh, the amount of power, that uptime that we have in the event of, of outages also helps to protect our equipment. We do have UPSs now. They don't necessarily support us for a long amount of time, but enough to take equipment down safely and, and to protect it. Uh, continue to improve on our operational efficiencies, end user service support and documentation. Uh, that's just operationally, try to be as operationally sound as possible. And, uh, and we do have a, an E-rate project uh, that, that and with the E-rate program, it is a federal subsidy uh, that we have applied for. We're just waiting for the approval. Last year it was, uh, we replaced our wireless uh, net, uh, network. Uh, this year, it's going to be uh, we're going to be, be able to replace a portion of our core switches, and with the focus being at Central, and that's really Central has become our hub. Is, is we're we're very much a hub and spoke network. It is the central point of our network, so we're going to upgrade that equipment first. Nice part about that is the equipment that we're replacing. We're not going to get rid of it. It'll actually be able to be used in the event of if we have an outage at one of the, uh, the, the other locations, we can swap out parts and, and, and use it moving forward. So th those upgrades uh, will be included in that five-year plan to get the other schools uh, updated as well. Uh, we're also going to do a three-year uh, roadmap and budget plan for the instructional side. Uh, but we're gonna, just going to do three years, uh, technology, especially classroom technologies. Uh, we want to really want to evaluate what our options are, not extend too far out, but still extend out far enough to where, again, we could de develop a, a good budget plan and really give uh, our instructional team some focus and, and also look at what, what areas we can impact and at what grade levels, but look at virtual uh, reality technologies, 3D design, app design, <coughs> Um, maybe expanding STEAM down to the intermediate uh, levels. Uh, 21st century classroom, in, in, in working with the, you know, we're, we're looking at the facilities, uh, you know, redesign. Well, you know, what does a 21st century classroom look like? And, and, and is that something that we could also look at? Uh, maker spaces, expanding, uh, expanding coding, so forth. Um, this will very much be, <clears throat> um, you know, when the, 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 the department 
uh, really looks at its technology and innovation. And what we really want to do is not put any limits on what we could potentially do. Obviously, there's going to be budget constraints on what we can actually do, but at least to be able to be thoughtful and look at what all of our options and then look at it more of uh, like a cafeteria plan. Well, where do we want to invest resources in expanding what programs, but what does that look like? <clears throat> Other, uh, you know, from a, from a major initiatives uh, standpoint, uh, we want to uh, develop student technology targets by grade level. Just some, some, some basic competencies uh, for each grade level based on the ISTE standards. Um, but uh, targets so that s teachers would know um, what to be um, uh, working on uh, in, in a given school year. And it would also allow for, as, as, as students progress by grade level, an expectation what teachers could expect students to know when they enter a particular grade level. Uh, continued uh, consideration of, uh, of current research and effective practices and what does appropriate use of, uh, of technology look like for, for students at various grade levels. What's ISTE? Uh, ISTE is an international, it's a science and technology uh, uh, organization. Uh, they have developed these international standards for, uh, for students based on uh, 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 some, some major categories. Uh, so those standards, <clears throat> and they just recently updated those standards. There's teacher um, standards and then coaches right. standards, <clears throat> standards, so. What we'd also look to do is uh, just continue with, uh, last year when we presented uh, to you, these were some of the major initiatives on the instructional side. And we're continuing on with those that uh, they, they were highly successful and continuing those moving forward in uh, uh, um, implementing those uh, uh, with, with teachers and, and students, uh, really focused on professional development. Um, <clears throat> Jason uh, Smith and Kelly King, uh, they're going to start, uh, the, the next portion of it is going to uh, center around instructional tech, really focusing on the, what research we have done and then how it applies to District 96 and then how we're utilizing technology. So we took uh, the challenge to look at how are we appropriately using technology in District 96, mainly focusing on kindergarten through second grade, but I think it's great to look at it in terms of kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, to us, technology is a tool it does not replace great teaching, which we have here. We have great teachers. But how can we utilize that tool for student creation, for student voice, for ownership, differentiation in the classroom? And so we had the, the opportunity to kind of look at different research um, on screen time and appropriate use of technology. And I think we could all have our own point of view professionally and personally, you know, like as parents, how do we regulate screen time at home? But I think it's a very important initiative at school of how we, how we regulate screen time. Um, we are not a district that just puts a device in front of a student and let them play apps all day. Um, you know, that just like at home, we wouldn't want our, student, our children to do that as well. Um, we are a district that really wants to look at the use of technology intentionally and appropriately. We want to look at different effective ways that we can support learning using technology as that tool. And I think that's Kelly's and my role as well, where we're here to serve our teachers and support our teachers, whether it's pushing into classrooms, whether it's working one-on-one -on -one with them, in small group, we even teach, uh, we teach in a classroom, we work with them in teams. Um, as Don said, professional development is big for us. Uh, we've, we're starting our second year of a Google boot camp where we're, I, I totaled up in the two years, we've worked with 104 uh, staff members. Um, it's not only just teachers, but it's district office, it's administrators, it's nurses, it's parapros, all just learning about how we can use technology as a tool. Um, we also wanted to look at the research saying what limitations are we going to put on the use of technology within the classroom. And um, I created a video that you'll see in a little bit where teachers are talking about the limitations that we are putting on the students within the class. Um, a big attention or focus for us is digital citizenship. Um, to me, that's huge right now. Um, when we turn technology over to students, whether it's inside or outside of school, are we equipping them to be good citizens online, to make good decisions? 
I think a great analogy would be is if someone wants to learn to cook, we just don't hand them a knife and say, good luck, <laughs> right? Um, it's the same thing with technology, right? We want to equip our students that they're going to make good decisions as they move forward, that they're realizing that technology can be a tool to collaborate, to create, to connect to the world for a global, global audience. But we do need to prepare them to make those good decisions. And if something bad does happen, how are they going to react to it? And something we're going to be talking to teachers about, um, even at this upcoming Institute Day on Friday, is how digital citizenship is really turning into just good citizenship for the students in today's day and age. Because these students are exposed to technology from day one, from early learners. So it's kind of that social emotional component in general for them now. How can we be good citizens in real life and online? Because it's not really separate anymore. Um, it's kind of all together. So that's really a big focus for us as well this year. Um, and just some of, like Jason said, the research we did just found how important that digital citizenship component is because we put so much emphasis on the SEL component in educating the whole child. We want to include that digital citizenship portion as well. Um, for us, we took from the research as well, and I think it fits what we strive to do every day when we use technology is that it's purposeful and meaningful within our classroom, um, that it's developmentally appropriate. Um, you'll see a lot in the video um, students creating and having a voice to their learning, whether it's in math or reading. Uh, it's engaging that they're excited to be learning and to uh, take ownership in their, uh, in their work. And then also active, just not passive in the classroom. Um, so I, the next slide will be us just kind of playing this video. And I, I hope it's something where it's, you're seen within the classroom. It's seen um, through the lens of the teacher, through the lens of the students, um, but also just seeing what goes on every day um, within our kindergarten through second grade rooms. Um, when I talked to the teachers and Kelly talked to the teachers, it was like, we wish they could just come in and see it, right? And so instead of us just showing you slides of text and research, I wanted you to see um, technology in action. Um, because, like I said earlier, I feel at times it gets kind of a bad rap of just being apps. And are we just tracing letters the whole time? Or are we just playing <coughs> duck, duck, moose or something like that? Not that that's bad. But what are our students using it for? And um, it's amazing to see uh, what they're capable of when we give them the choice to kind of share their voice in creation. So. I think one of the really cool things you'll see in this video is just how young these students are already and they're really taking ownership of their own learning. Um, you'll hear students in this video talk about something that was challenging for me was, and they're explaining it on video, um, they're doing a math problem and voicing over how they came to that answer. Um, so it's just great that at even such a young age, again, like Jason said, we're not doing things that are app-based. They're always creating, reflecting on their work, and then taking so much ownership of the things that they're doing, even starting as early as kindergarten. Um, just to talk a little bit about what they're using technology in an EC, where, um, where we're not using it one-to-one. -one. They're, um, they're only using it for students who might need it for adaptive technology, speech-to-text recognition, things like that. Um, and some fine motor skill honing and things like that. But um, those were kind of the things we found after interviewing our early learner teachers. And then um, Jason will go ahead and start the video. And the focus of our video is, again, like he said, the kindergarten through second grade classrooms. And Kelly, I'm just going to point out maybe you said that, like that 15 to 20, you had it's right there on the slide. Yeah. It's 15 to 20 minutes per, per week. week. And that's only for the kids that are um, in the special ed program. Is that correct? Or is that, do you understand it correct, correctly or not? Yes. Yeah. The, 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 all the early learners. Early learners. Learners. It's just the blended. It's the community the students and the students class. with IEP. Yeah. So even the ones that don't have an IEP right. would have this. They're, they're not really utilizing it instructionally beyond just for kids who might need some support or for some fine motor activities. The kids, there's only one per classroom, and they feel like that makes it good. And as part of a center of learning, they're not there for a long time. All the centers are like 15 to 20 minutes, and the students are moving through different centers. And students, but typically, they're used for students who may need the device very good fine motor tracing um, apps and things for students who um, may have more difficulty holding, holding a writing tool. So it's a different way to help them work out those skills. District 96, we believe in instructional technology as a powerful tool in our learning. 
And it's a tool that does not replace great teaching is what we, what we have here in the district, but it's a tool that allows our students to design, create, and build and showcase what they're learning in class and gives them a voice to their education in that creation process. When we meet with teachers and when we're in classrooms of all grade levels, whether it's primary, intermediate, or middle school, um, we're constantly encouraging teachers to remember that technology is just one tool in a big toolkit of best practices and great instruction, which our teachers in District 96 are doing an excellent job of. In kindergarten, we begin our use of technology with iPads sometime in October. In kindergarten, we spend an average of 15 to 30 minutes per week. The children are listening to stories if they're nine readers and recording stories for fluency once they become stronger readers. During Central Time, the children are using the iPads during math for number practice and number sense one, one correspondence. And we do also include special projects, creating presentations that we are able to share with the families. Here in District 96 in first grade, we use this technology as a tool for learning. Specifically in the classroom, we use iPads. And we use iPads for about 15 to 45 minutes daily on average. We use them during reading centers where students are able to access books at their individual reading level. They can also then record themselves reading and listen to them self-reading um, to check for fluency. We also use iPads during math instruction as well for students to practice their fact fluency. Um, we also use Seesaw, which is an online um, portfolio app that allows students to really document their learning in the classroom. They can also record themselves explaining a project that they did. They can take photographs and then explain what the photograph is. I'm really excited this year for students to use this app because they can check and see how their learning has changed over the course of the school year. So they can explain their math strategy towards the beginning of the year and then check it throughout the year to see how their thinking and explanation has changed throughout the year. The students absolutely love using iPads in the classroom and it's really a great way to get them to create things, to also be able to collaborate with their peers and also share these things with their parents and teachers. At um, Hollywood Elementary in second grade, we're using technology uh, for electronic portfolios. We're using Seesaw. This allows uh, students to show me that they've mastered uh, particular standards, uh, and it helps the students with seeing their progress on that standard. It allows us to use flexibility. They can take video, they can take photographs, they can make drawings. It allows us to make portfolios that uh, are easier to access. When working with teachers, we always encourage them to take a look at the four C's and how they can implement them within their instruction, whether they are using technology or not. The four C's are collaboration, critical thinking, communication, and creativity. And we also encourage teachers to think about the fifth C, which is so important, which is curiosity. When looking forward to the future of technology integration within our curriculum, I think a sixth C that we can take a look at is coding and how we can embed coding into our curriculum for our students. On Mondays, we use work work as a whole group, and then students have an opportunity to practice this skill individually, and we use Seesaw as a tool for identifying if kids are mastering this skill in a, in a situation where they can then post it individually. I can review it, and then I have an opportunity to share that with families, and they have a really great idea of what will be done in class. So today we're working on a long e sound using Bible Buddies, and the kids are searching through their bag books, and searching for about many words that they feel represent that um, sounding out strategy. And after we take a look at this, I'm going to be able to pull small groups from it and really intervene with kids and a little bit extra support with the sounding out strategy 
are about it is to keep pushing forward and uh, focus on setting up strategies that are even more challenging. So hopefully that was just a bit of a snapshot, just kind of how students are creating. Um, I think the one program you might have heard multiple teachers talk about is Seesaw. Um, Seesaw is a great program that we use with our students because it's kind of like a digital portfolio where students are able to post work that they've created. Um, the teacher can collect it and it's also a great way to interact with home. Um, Seesaw allows students to take a picture let's say of their dry erase board while they're solving a math problem and then they can voice over how did they solve that problem they can then share their ipad with another student and then they can learn from each other well how did that person solve it or uh get kind of their thought process behind it all as well they can draw on it um, they can take video um, so it's really multifunctional for them where they can kind of showcase their learning um, the next thing is for us is the STEAM update. So this is going to start year two for our STEAM program at Hauser Junior High. Um, we've kind of made a few changes like I think you would normally would do after a year. Um, the year one, year one I thought went really well. Um, Stephen Jones did a great job teaching a variety of classes. Um, it was a lot of different classes we threw at him and he handled it really well, growing and implementing new ideas. We had a site visit from Hillside uh, School District came and saw what we were doing in our STEAM program and kind of wanted to take back some of their ideas to their district. Um, and this year, what we've, we've made a, a few slight changes that I wanted to let you know about. The first one is in sixth grade. We're having one class, which is Intro to STEAM. And the main goal for that class is to introduce STEAM practices or design thinking ideas. Um, the engineering introduction to engineering and then just that uh, using some of the programs like Tinkercad that how could they can di design that eventually can be 3D printed. Um, Mr. Jones takes a is really serious and I love it into that design thinking um, where we kind of start falling in love with like a problem instead of just the one solution. So how can we creatively and collaborate with each other to solve a problem in a variety of different ways. And it really, I think, challenges the students to start um, you know, working together, expanding their thought process about, um, like example could be is a cardboard chair challenge, right? How can they design uh, chairs using engineering practices? Um, and other ideas that he's done last year was like a cardboard boat challenge and a marble challenge and so forth. And he does a great job of integrating technology in it as well. So just like in Seesaw, we saw students documenting through voice um, he kind of does like vlogs, video blogs, where students explain where they are, are at in the process, um, if they're kind of like still a tinkerer or if they're learning the process. Um, and then they can kind of just share where their ideas are, how they've kind of pivoted or made a change, um, and kind of learn from their design practice and thinking. Seventh grade, we're still offering two. We made a slight change. We're doing STEAM design, which is still more of that design thinking and then uh, with 3D printing. But then we added circuitry. Um, so students can learn circuits. Um, and then for eighth grade, we still have two as well, STEAM design to continue forward, but then we still are offering entrepreneur class. Last year we made bathroom signs, which was exciting to kind of see student work up around the district. Uh, Merrill had some signs made as well for institute days where teachers can sign in and it's the school name. Margie has a sign by her, uh, her desk where uh, visitors sign in as well that our classes design created and that was a combination of a a sign with a 3D model on it. Um, but he's kind of branching out more as well. Um, Mr. Jones looks at, like, does a lot of uh, purpose, like passion and purpose projects, what are students passionate about? And one of the tweaks we've made in the entrepreneurial is that students can look at their passions and maybe how they can use their passions but solve a potential problem. So one of them right now is a student who's really into animals and is trying to 3D print little uh, paw protectors potentially to. Uh, for therapy dogs. So kind of looking at students' passions, uh, he's doing a bike lane project um, where, um, you know, how we can maybe look at the infrastructure of the roads and how we can include bike lanes. Last year he talked about uh, home design and the engineering behind the home design and students are able to 3D print um, as well. So I think it's a huge success so far in year two, um, you know, just kind of continuously looking at where we're at and how we can grow the program. Okay, just and then now just picking up uh, 
back uh, with the remainder of the goals. Uh, continued focus on uh, data security, privacy, and quality. Um, continuing to, to integrate uh, the various systems that we have um, with our information systems. Um, we are evaluating some secure rostering uh, and resource access platforms uh, that would allow for uh, a greatly increased single sign-on opportunities, which <clears throat> in, in speaking with uh, uh, our members of the tech steering committee, our teaching uh, members, our teachers, uh, that they've seen with <clears throat> some of the rostering, the, one of the rostering programs that we're using right now, what they're seeing is the, with the decrease in time that it takes students to actually log on because there's a variety of passwords uh, that they might be utilizing. Uh, that, that's actually us an opportunity to boost some instructional time by decreasing that, uh, the amount of time it takes them to log in uh, to the ver various resources. <clears throat> Continued expansion of our information, our information system reporting capabilities. We have, um, uh, we have integrated a, a, a plugin for um, uh, behavior reporting um, within uh, PowerSchool. Uh, continued focus on uh, uh, student data privacy. Uh, I know that uh, board member Barsati and I have uh, been talking about and working on this for a number of years. <clears throat> and one of the conversations we had uh, after our tech steering committee meeting this uh, <clears throat> uh, a couple of weeks ago was just that in terms of our policies and our practices that we have in District 96 are actually, <clears throat> um, we have stricter policies and procedures and I'd say a lot of districts, uh, not only in the area but around uh, across the country. Uh, but we'll still continue to uh, do our due diligence and uh, uh, up those standards uh, um, as we <clears throat> um, uh, learn more about um, well, right now there's some new legislation, the state has some new legislation that we'll be responding to uh, and because this is obviously a, a hot topic uh, and we just want to make sure that we're on the front end of it uh, when it comes to uh, uh, student data privacy. So there is some new state legislation. Uh, actually, uh, Martha and I tomorrow have an appointment with uh, the district attorney to go over some of that new legislation, review our uh, data uh, student data privacy practices uh, and look to see what the impact is of the, of the new legislation along with uh, how it might impact our, our policies and procedures and then how can we respond uh, moving forward um, if we need to make any additional changes. Uh, communications, parent engagement, uh, explore, continue to explore expansion of our uh, parent and student portal via PowerSchool. <clears throat> um, at the uh, middle school at the junior high uh, students and parents log into PowerSchool um, as we look to expand some of the uh, offerings that PowerSchool has now. PowerSchool has a lot of integrated products that could extend to providing more information to to uh, parents when it comes to uh, uh, student learning and uh, student data. <coughs> uh, we also will be uh, um, uh, we use a product for content filtering on our Chromebooks called Securely. Securely has, now has a parent portal that we'll be rolling out to parents and give parents the opportunity to actually give parents <coughs> access to students' browsing history. So if they wanted to see where students were going, uh, they could have access to that information. Um, and then of course we're going to be having the uh, new website which will, we hope to improve the uh, overall access and ease of access to information. And that's all we have for right now. Any questions? Does anyone have any questions for Don or Jason or Kelly? I have a few actually. Um, I, first of all, I say that uh, you guys have done a huge amount of work and it's really very impressive. Um, if you think about where we were you know, just a few years ago compared to where we are now, it's really a kind of night and day. Uh, and it's very thoughtful. You're thinking, you're thinking hard about a lot of the right issues and not just on the uh, infrastructure side, but also on the, on the instructional side, which ultimately is you know, kind of what we're all about. Um, and I like the fact that you're sort of thinking long term about what the five year plan is, and laying all those out and uh, trying to figure out you know, what the priorities are. Um, but I guess I, I have a couple of questions, sort of very general questions um, about how you are evaluating the, you know, um, on, on the instructional side, how you're evaluating um, 
whether things are actually working or not. I mean, I saw the video, saw the kids were all engaged, you know, it looks like they're having a lot of fun. But just to take a kind of a devil's advocate um, view, it's like I could ask, well, okay, there looks like you're, you know, doing their math on their iPad. Why is that better than if they were doing their math on a piece of paper or, or at the whiteboard? And what's what, you know, what, what evidence do we have that this, this in fact is helping the kids learn math better than if they just did something uh, lower tech? So yeah, it's a very I, general question. Right. I, guess, I think um, like I think the example of doing the math, it's not necessarily on the iPad, right? Mm -hmm. They're still doing it like they could still do it on a worksheet or a whiteboard. Or a whiteboard. Um, but it's still allowing them to capture their thought process and kind of explain their answer. Like I think in one of those, it was interesting to hear a student say, I struggled with this or this was hard to me, but, um, and I think it's just allowing the teacher then to see where they're at. And then a lot of times differentiate and break into groups and pull uh, smaller groups of students and they could work together. Um, so I think it's also where you see sometimes with iPads, um, where students can just record their voice and I say this a lot like I think a great after like a presentation um, You can record your thoughts, you know, like via video real quick and then the next day rewatch that video So it basically becomes like an exit slip and then a bell ringer and then I can share that video with Kelly And she could share hers with mine and then we can kind of learn from each other in that collaborative approach um, I understand what you're saying, right? What's the difference of me just saying it to Kelly or whatnot? Um, but I also think it's a great way for students to look back and learn from um, their journey in that process, whether it's through reading and hearing themselves read again and where they're grown. grown. But I think it's great for a student to just kind of work through the problem, um, you know, step by step, but then also kind of explain their steps along the way. So I feel like technology is just that tool that they can capture it. They don't do it all the time in math, but I think it's a great way for them to capture it at that moment. And then a teacher can see where they're at and then kind of gauge their level uh, of understanding and then they can kind of break it into groups like in the movie or the video you saw there's like a small group around kind of that one table mm -hmm. you know by looking at the different levels of where the students are they can kind of break down and differentiate while students are all working together as well mm -hmm. i think a big thing too with looking at 21st century learning in general and then using technology versus not using technology kind of two points here but one is giving the kids more of a larger audience than just the audience of one the teacher or the audience of a small group or a partner student um, because like for Seesaw for example if all the students post kind of like a formative assessment like an exit ticket video at the end of a lesson and then I'm able to watch six videos to kind of be our kickoff for that lesson I think the students take a little bit more stock in doing that formative assessment when they know it's not just my teacher watching it they know their peers are watching it and kind of creating that global audience and then to your point what's the difference between doing math on a worksheet and then math on an iPad if you were using like a math based app um, like Jason and I did last year and then this year our big focus with PD for staff is the SAMR model so again we tell we say to teachers doing a worksheet on a Chromebook it's mm -hmm. still a worksheet boring stuff on a Chromebook is still boring so then again how can we raise the bar and not just substitute things you could do paper pencil with technology how can we use the technology in a way that's going to enhance the lesson or the unit or the outcomes that wouldn't have been possible mm -hmm. before so that's kind of our main purpose in all of this is to raise the bar a little bit and encourage teachers um, we use kind of a pool analogy to dive into the deep end of modifying or redefining the lesson using the technology mm -hmm. so just uh, just to kind of uh, just follow up on that point though I mean um, so you're sort of I think what you're saying is that there are qualitatively different things they can do when they're using the iPad than what they could do if they're just using a, a piece of paper or if they're on the whiteboard they can they can share it with other people yeah. and other kids and all these other things but just on the uh, sort of on the um, the, the, the sort of like we, we, we take the, all these standardized tests, okay, and the state tells us we got to take all these standardized tests. And I, I'm not saying this is the only measure of like you know learning. There are obviously other ones, but if we just restrict ourselves to that particular measure, you know, so one of the standardized tests, do we expect to see improvements in our students' test scores? Like uh, like for example, in the park, we you know we have a lot of kids that don't meet expectations. Are we expecting to see? because of all this technolo uh, technology work that will get more kids that are actually meeting expectations. Is that is that one of our expectations from this? And if so, are we seeing evidence that actually, actually that's happening? Um, I, can't, I can't answer to the evidence part, being mm -hmm. uh, year two in the position, mm -hmm. uh, year three here in the district. Yeah. Um, I think though, if we look at technology, as Kelly said, just as that tool where we use it where it's appropriate, right? It's not, um, 
you know, all day, 45 minutes or 40 minutes of class period, we're on the technology, we're using it. Um, I think where it's appropriate um, and how we can use it to have that global audience or to work on different skill sets of like whether it's presenting or collaborating or researching or connecting, um, you know, with, if, with different experts in the, uh, in the field. I think when students take more of an interest in their learning, I think then hopefully, right, we're going to, they can apply themselves to want to grow, to want to learn, um, to want to strengthen themselves as students. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like in that, in the research that we talked about with the engaging, um, you know, we're not just putting it in front of them and thinking it's going to cure it all. Mm -hmm. But I think if we use technology appropriately, uh, we can capture that engagement and we can allow them to take ownership in that learning. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the more they, ownership they take, then hopefully the desire they have to learn and grow, which then applies to maybe the standardized test and to show growth. Mm -hmm. Meryl will probably have a yeah. more uh, <laughs> Actually, I better answer. Yeah. Sort of the complexity of your question. I don't think that as the assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction that I can point to any one measure and attribute that to the overall growth we're hoping to see. I think the complexity of what we do and the way we deliver things, that the combination of having critical thinking, higher level problem solving opportunities, inquiry based curriculum, strategies of differentiation, the makeup of the classroom environment and the supports we're putting in place for students, all of those factors combined, the rigor of the content we've just adopted, right? All of those things are factors in what would hopefully then support us and improve test scores over time. And those things don't happen overnight, but we have seen some needles on the scale starting to go up around our collective commitments to improving teaching and learning. And we were just talking about this at DLT earlier today in some of those pilot classrooms where we've seen some implementation of pilot units and curriculum. We've seen specific classes that we can point to and say, yes, they implemented this with integrity and did X, Y, and Z, provided those higher level learning opportunities and those combined factors have created stronger performances in students. You know, I think all of it, our teachers have taken on a lot in the last three years that all of us have sort of stepped into these roles and started to move that needle. But I think that will also take time. But I think your question is, is an interesting one, but a complex one to take any one target and say that's why. Well, I realize there's a very yeah. there's a serious problem in, in sort of inferring the causal relations here between right. The, the, the but, because we've got you know, say we've got a bunch of ten uncontrolled experiments right. going on simultaneously, so it's obviously impossible. But I would expect in aggregate we should see we should see improvements. That's in the, aggregate, right? I would agree. It's hard to disaggregate though what the impact right. of that would be versus also, another aspect of what we do. Jeff's comment, I guess I, one question I do have, do have is how are these apps, I mean, how are these applications decided what we use? I mean, that, that I haven't really sort of figured out. It sounds like a lot of it comes from teachers. I know they do vetting, but I guess how are these, uh, because there's so much out there, and one person might say, oh, I like this, one person might say, I like that, and I know we vetted for like safety and security in that, but I mean, how do we know that what we're using is actually going to be beneficial? So we've begun some of those processes of cleaning up and identifying sort of those core resources that we know are contributing to improve learning experiences. And teachers, just because they put something in, I mean, we've said no to things <laughs> as we don't see the added value or we have something else that we've already identified. So we've cleaned up the process quite a bit. And I think in our three-year plan, we'll see more, even more definition around what we know has had that impact of moving learning forward and sort of the SAMR, that, that not that just replacement wrote like, oh, you're doing a worksheet on a computer, but that Seesaw is a good example of one that's pretty much been pushed out across K2 because of the value and the collaboration, the communication, the critical thinking. So it's not, when we first got here, Don and I had a list of a lot that was out there, and we've since gone through and cleaned up. Yeah, I don't and, think you want to we, see that one. We've cleaned it up and, quite and, a bit. And some of, especially um, in terms of our our iPad devices, uh, as iPads get upgraded, a lot of those old apps just they just tend to go away because they don't work anymore. Number one, so there's a, but but I th in, in conversations I know that uh, Jason and Kelly have had with our teachers, there's also a. <clears throat> um, 
they also want to scale back <clears throat> and really focus because when you have so much out there, it's it's too much. It's overwhelming. We shouldn't have <clears throat> we shouldn't have a hundred plus apps on a device. Uh, there are some you know some some legacy applications that are out there that have been out there, but they are looking for that that focus as well. From a district resource standpoint, uh, I'd say the vast majority of the well the re resources that we're utilizing for educational purposes are they they have been coming through curriculum. Um, and these are the resources that we subscribe to as a district. Now what we have put in place is beyond those resources, teachers do have, I mean, they're very accustomed to, to seeing or going maybe going to a conference or saying, oh, hey, there's this new tool. Or they, they subscribe to a publication like, oh, there's this great resource out there. So um, th that is something that I feel we have a much better control on than we have had in the past. It is something that now we, it's much more quantifiable for us as to what teachers are using. Um, and we've put that control of use in the hands of the parents. And I'm really trying to say to, to, to staff, if you want to use this, number one, if you want to use this website, if you are providing any level of student information, uh, then number one, it needs to be vetted first. It needs to meet a certain base uh, uh, security uh, a check uh, with regards to encryption of data as it's transferred, uh, backups of that data, and the site security. Now, once it meets that, then they can send a permission slip home and, and ask and, and ask the, uh, the the parents if their students can use the, uh, the use the resource. <clears throat> but as new legislation, you know, comes through and as we're evaluating, we're even going to reevaluate that process to. Um, how strict should we be relative to saying, okay, you can send it home for to forget parental uh, approval? Um, so we feel we have much better control of it, uh, but we still need to continue to uh, tighten up. Um, and I know through conversations that we we have had from the committee is is being more proactive on one of the <clears throat> one of the uh, suggestions that came up is when it comes to that that data that is out there. Um, having the district make the request to remove that data um, proactively as opposed to <clears throat> leaving it up to the parent. Uh, so I know with the new Illinois legislation, it basically, it, it says that if we request it, if we request the removal of that data, you have to remove that data. So we're, again, in, in working with our attorneys, going to, we'll probably have to modify our, uh, um, um, our addendum, our, our, our uh, data security and privacy addendum that we have, and then moving forward, we'll use that. And if it's an educational question, like you asked <coughs> Mr. Barsati about the value of that tool, that question gets asked when something's submitted. So Jason, Kelly, myself, Don, we will look at it. There has to be a rationale for what it is, <coughs> where is it supporting what we're doing in the curriculum, and where is it in alignment. And if we don't see those things, or if we have something else we've already <coughs> identified that's serving that same purpose, we will point it in that direction. And then if we add something, we will look at that usage to determine whether Indeed is meeting that need to say, yes, that's something we should expand or something we should, and we've tried and we don't want it. And, and from a, that quantitative standpoint of, you know, is there any, you know, it's the whole uh, correlation, causation type, it's difficult to, 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 to measure <clears throat> or, to, or to prove. Um, one of the resources that um, was offered, and we used it last year for our, uh, our, our, our as a survey platform called Bright Bites, <clears throat> um, they have added a, a new um, area to that, and it's, it's offered to us now um, uh, via the West 40 um, uh, uh, group. Uh, but that what they're trying they're trying to do that they're trying to at least give you s give us some level of possible correlation between um, utilization and in using the, the utilization and 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 aligning that to uh, test score data so again there's an attempt to again to get that one to one say this is causing that difficult but uh, at least it, it's positive to see that the thinking is moving in that direction is how can we show that it is that there's value because not only value from a uh, instructional standpoint you know that we're we're getting the return on the not only investment uh, financially but also the investment of time in students using a resource should that time you know be used elsewhere or a different resource uh, it's 
it's the first year they're doing it. It's not a perfect, you know, uh, but but it, 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 it should provide some level of data points for the future for at least to look at and what we don't have now. Um, the rostering platforms that, uh, you know, that one that we're using and um, uh, another one that we're going to look at, it does provide that single point of access for students to uh, and, and, and staff to access resources that those platforms also provide us uh, utilization data like how many how many hits how many clicks you know even just going into a resource again it's it's something it's not pro, you know providing that a, a causation or helping with but but it, it's more data and I think more and more you're going to see as school districts need that information for resources and sites to provide that information um, in terms of uh, utilization and, and uh, uh, possible uh, other measures. I was going to say too, Ms. Brooks, how do you say that? Like how do we choose or how do we work with, uh, Kelly and I are very aware that our teachers are being introduced to a lot of new curricular areas and so forth. So the last thing we want to do is throw the newest and best thing at them. So we are very cognizant of that and we look at what was piloted before I took the position or moved into the position and that was Seesaw and we Video. So how can we, uh, you know, both of them student voice, like how can they make a video or create something? So we kind of took those two and then, you know, continue to model those and push those or work with teachers on those. And then the Google Apps for Education. So how can we use Google Slides, Google Drawings, Google Sites, yeah. Google Docs and so forth. And everything that we always recommend is that creation base. Yeah. And I know I say that a lot, but to me, learning is creation, not consumption. Right? So how can we create? How can we build? And we rarely ever push an app because um, we want to have that engaged, <coughs> not passive. So uh, we're very aware of it as well because we usually do a lot of, we still do those, uh, introduced it last year, the live with Jason and Kelly videos. <laughs> uh, we still do those. We made a new logo this year. Yeah. You know, so I uh, still introduce items, right? We still introduce uh, professional development to our staff, but it's, it's kind of looking at what we already are using and how can we apply it in new, maybe a new way. Uh, how can we build on the skill set that our students are, you know, uh, developing? And when we're meeting with our K two teachers, I, I think for both of us, I we have never recommended just like a learning app. Everything, like Jason said, is always creative, like creating a book or creating a video, because again, like that's how the students can use technology to take it to the next level. Because again, a lot of what they can do on an app, whether it's like phonics based, math based, they could do that in real life. It's just replacing it. So everything we're recommending to our primary teachers is always creation based. We're, we've never gone in and talked to a kindergarten through second grade teacher and said, we heard about this really great math game app. It's just not something we really believe in how our students learn. Yeah, and, and Jason brings up a really good point is that, you know, in with the the vast majority when it comes to the things that as a department we introduce or, or maybe um, put uh, make a recommendation for you know subscription to they, they really have been all of that um, creative uh, uh, creative type resources it has been the Wii video it has been um, seesaw where they're creating and it's a, 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 a it's, it's, it's a quasi learning management system uh, portfolio development and as we look to as we look at learning management systems it, it, it's about that creation aspect uh, from the um, the, the vast majority of the other resources, it, it, we are in more of a reactive posture of, of we're getting requests for things, but we have the vetting processes in place where, you know, really the, the resources, the instructional resources are really coming through curriculum instruction. Um, and then any other uh, uh, secondary resources, uh, supplemental resources that staff want to use, it's there evaluated. And then it's uh, you know parent, parental permission and, and, and uh, before student use. Can I just go I, um, before I say I, I read some research and I just wanted to share a little bit. But um, the three of you are incredibly organized and talented and care about children. I want to say that first and foremost. And I'm extremely happy the way that you support our staff. Um, however, I have read some because I enjoy educational research. It's so much fun to read. Um, but I'm concerned that there has been a study of over 70 countries in those countries that invested heavily in educational technology and communications technology saw no significant gains in reading or math or science. 
And those that did heavy use actually saw declines in reading. And I'm not a little bit concerned. I'm, I'm concerned. And I, I am not an anti-tech house. Um, I think what you're doing is great. I, I understand your need for balance. Um, what I'm concerned about is the use of screens for abstract versus concrete thinking. And they've shown that computers are really good at looking up information, concrete skills and facts and numbers, but they actually cause problems with abstract thinking in children. And so I would re what I'm asking the administration to do is to take a look at what the research says about growing brains and, and grown-up brains. Taking notes in the computer has been shown to be not good for retention, whether you're a college student or five years old. And I really want to take a look at educational research and I want you guys to show us where the achievement is gained because I'm not, I'm not seeing it when I'm reading the research. And I'm just coming from a place of caution. Um, but I, I do love how you support the staff and I think, you know, you have just secured our systems and privacy of our students is amazing. Um, so I don't think you're doing anything bad in any way. I think you care about them very deeply. But I really want to come from, instead of I think this is true, I feel this is true, is it really research backed? And that's what I'd like to hear from you guys. Yeah, I haven't and, read it. And I can appreciate that, Sherry, and we can look at different sources and also yeah. what kind of usage there was. Because right. that's, I mean, that's the was, other question I would it have. It was general is, screen time. Yeah. It wasn't about an app right. versus a video. It really wasn't. It was about using technology and screens. And I want to have some caution for that. I think um, this is not an insignificant that, subject. Yeah, so. and, I mean, that sort of was, was, my, right. with what was my question. It wasn't so much the technology. Cause, I mean, I, I, I agree with like, the technology is a tool. It's not. Um, it's, it's the just a tool. Right. That's why it's, it's more it's like, how do we decide what to use? Because yeah. I share, I mean, I'm in technology. <laughs> I mean, I, that's how I make my livelihood. But I, sh I share Sherry's. Uh, concern as well is it's like how much do we want to uh, I mean I know this is the direction education is going I mean, I mean that's you look at it pretty much any district in the country this is where it's going and, I, and we are doing from a privacy standpoint and a selection standpoint we're, we are doing a lot better than most districts out there however do we have to I mean is there do we need to keep going down this path or can we I mean, w that's why I want to sort of say, when we, when we choose a textbook, we don't just sort of say, oh, a teacher goes to a conference, oh, I like that textbook, let's go. We don't right. let them go buy the textbook for the whole class. That's right. sort of how I'm yeah, looking at this. Technology either. Right. I even think, like the platforms that we purchased for ELA, <coughs> we had the option to go fully tech-based, and we said no. We said mm -hmm. we wanted the workloads, we wanted the prime materials. We don't want solely online access. There are pieces within those curricular components that allow kids access that they can download and print, but the teachers tend to print the accessibility text versus having the kids read it. Sometimes it's student choice for preference on how they want to access that text. So I think in terms of our message to teachers is we're about balance and we're about making sure that print and authentic materials are the majority of the student day and that we won't say we want to be 100% tech savvy, but I also do think that your points are relevant in terms of making sure we continue to maintain those balances. Right, and are we and doing looking, things that research right. does say works, which is play right. and unstructured time and ability to write things down, to build, right. physically build. These are cognitive benefits, and I want to make sure we're supporting right. the other side before we look at Correct. the opposite. So. In the foundational areas. Yes. 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 Are they playing? Yeah. I mean, to right. share the points that, that Sherry and Dave both made, and one of the things that strikes me is the number of high-profile tech entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs, like Bill Gates, like the guy who founded Twitter, who don't, or at least did not, let their own kids use technology when they were, you know, uh, Steve Jobs said his kids didn't have an iPad, you know. Uh, Bill Gates didn't let his kids have, uh, didn't, until they were, you know, quite relatively old, basically. Um, so I think that there's, that's, that, that makes me wonder, you know, um, if they didn't see that as a valuable, such a valuable tool, you know, what, what are we missing something here? Uh, and, and the other thing that concerns me is, is, in particular with young kids, I mean, I can see the value, I can see a right. huge value in technology when you get to middle school, your STEAM program, all that. When you get to young kids, I mean, people evolved 
children, you know, so that you know, children learn by interacting with their natural surroundings, with uh, physical objects, stones, and sticks, and things like that. And we've replaced that a lot of that to some degree with you know images on a screen, very artificial, you know, sounds and pic pixels and all that. And how does that affect the development of the brain? I mean, we don't know that. No one knows that. And so it makes me very cautious about it. I would say uh, in our kindergarten and our early learning program, we have not done that. Mm -hmm. I would say that a lot of, you know, with the time that we do have, obviously the access to the outdoors, we talk about from a facility standpoint, right. it's a challenge for us. But and that's the, social, the good conversation we can have about facilities right. too. So the social, but the social play element of the early childhood program and the kindergarten program, the teachers will tell you that social interaction and that those skills are critical for the curriculum. I mean, much of what we talked about with the early learner teachers was we don't want any more technology. We have them on. We're good. We want to make sure what we have is updated, but we don't need five in the room because our focus is social play, problem solving. Mm -hmm. Um, and the kindergarten teachers, I think we heard from them too, you know, 15 minutes a week, or, you know, over the course of the week is not part of the two and a half hour Day. Right, and, and it can be very good for right. someone who, who doesn't who isn't able to vocalize or able you know for those accessibility pieces. I can I can absolutely I, see that. I was going to ask well, that part. Um, that that yeah, is necessary, those. and and yeah. we should not prevent someone who right. really needs it. My question is, um, in general, right. what is our thought process, and what is the research saying that there are going to be gains in the reading and math, which is you know what we focus and spend so much time on? Yeah. Is okay. is it working? Yeah. I, I, I don't mean to. Right. We to, I'm sorry. So I'm like, I'm trying to hear you. <laughs> we have to understand the academic piece. I mean, what's right. the academic piece of technology? Because the technology, like again, technology is a tool. It's not. Right. Um, so it's just. It's just and what, I think I'm proud to say, on average, we use it less than even in the two to eight-year-old research. What was put out there, the way we're using it, is even far less than. So when it's saying, oh, kids can be on there, you know, up to in a half-day program, 30 minutes a day, we're not doing that. Right. And for me, it's not even is it a detriment at so many minutes. Is is it a benefit? It I think is the question that I'm dying to hear the answer to. Um, well, does and, it work? And I think from besides research, engagement, but engagement comes in many different forms. And just because they are engaged doesn't mean that they are abstract thinking. And that's the question that the research that I've read is, is leading me to follow and, and wonder about. And I don't know the answer. And, and, I, think that's what um, and that's what concerns. Yeah, I think from a due diligence yeah. standpoint, to continue to evaluate right. the research, uh, right. I mean, technology, I mean, it's still relatively new, and right. and, and the, the the research studies behind it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're now entering an age where where more of those uh, research studies are coming out, mm -hmm. and we can evaluate it, and it's our responsibility to evaluate that, right. come back, and also make recommendations right. based upon that. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll some of that research will change over time based on the evolution of the expectation of the use of the technology. Because I can remember 10 years ago when Well, reading numbers are reading right. numbers. I mean, well, no, I don't know I if that's going to change. Sure, yeah. But I'm saying when technology was first introduced, when the studies were started, there was a lot of app-based yes. passive use. Yes. Right. Right. I was going to say the and evolution so of technology the just in the last yeah. decade. But it's also about the way the brain functions. Right. And that's my area of study from my own education, yeah. and that's what concerns me more, is the cognitive effects right. of yeah. not just how you use the screen, but the screen in general, versus something that is a tactile, tangible piece, and a play piece, which has been shown to actually be the way that children learn. Right. And so that's what I want to hear more about. Yeah, I, I want to say, I mean, I appreciate it. Just from my right. perspective, yeah. and you guys are amazing. Do I think that right. the middle schoolers should take all the computer? Yeah. No steam for you? Absolutely yeah. not. Well, I, Absolutely I, I not. I think I it's incredibly that. useful. Because, yeah. like, that's yes. honestly, like, not to share about myself, like, that's something I struggle with. Like, I am a no tech home. Like, and dude, that shocks people. My oldest is nine, <laughs> he does not have an iPad. Um, like, we play, we create, right. we <laughs> have fun. Now, do we make movies together about stuff? Yes. yes. But that's with me. Um, doesn't play video games, doesn't do any of that stuff. So I always joke with Kelly, like, I'm a no-tech dad, but I have this job, and people don't believe me, but it's the truth. And I want to say that I feel that technology is very, um, it's a very appropriately done here within our classrooms. I think a lot of it is, you can go to, in the ed tech world, and when I've done site visits, and I've met a lot of people from this past summer and so forth, and 
I mean, they're using tech all the time, all the time, all the time. And we did a site visit and it was introduced to a, a middle school student and we were like, oh, she's in our new program. Basically, it was online learning. Online class. And she's like, what do you think of it? And the girl's like, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> it gives me anxiety. It makes me stressful. I'm supposed to get to here. I can't get there. I'm supposed to check in with my teacher. Like, we're far from that. And that's a wonderful thing, in my opinion. Um, but I do appreciate that, that I think that's important for us to look into. Um, can't stand here and answer that question, you know, right now. I know. So. Just a, a study, I mean, I probably saw it, just a review that came out last month. Um, an economist at the University of Toronto and an educator at Columbia, they just did a systematic review, basically, of all um, controlled experiments in uh, technology applied to education. There's only been like 130 actually in the history of technology, and, um, and there the have been controlled, exp you know, randomized controlled experiments or uh, uh, regression design discontinuity studies, or basically quasi experiments. And so it's very interesting because you can see actually in that very small set, it's a huge industry. I mean, it's like multi billion dollar industry. Of course, these technology firms want to sell all this stuff, but there have been only a handful, a relatively small number of uh, controlled experiments where they can see does this work or does it not work. Um, so it's kind of worth it's worth seeing, actually. It's hard to answer the question. I don't think there's mm -hmm. enough direct. And that's my question: is then why are we doing it? Uh, Honestly, just or is there another way that we can focus on? And until I see the data, I'm not sure. I just don't know. And I'm not saying get rid of everything. I'm saying I really want to know why we're doing what we're doing, and does it work? I mean, what's the point of them engaging? And I think you heard tonight some of the things we're focused yeah. on. We'll continue yeah. to read and research and keep an eye on. Right, and and even if it's creative, does that lead right. to achievement? Honestly, uh, that I'm, yeah. I haven't and seen I it know. yet, and I want to know. Yeah. yeah. So know. thank you. Yeah. But I don't think there's a straightforward answer. I think that's the point. Aggregate level. I, mean, I think that's the point. Averages, is that there isn't no yet. change in test scores yeah. in 20 years. I mean, I mean across the wide, yeah. the map scores is like so like. But again, I, I would look at that and say what I did with the technology in my classroom 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It could ago. be that this it's now is different. It could be yeah. true. Yeah, but people know. might have been saying that 10 yeah. years ago, too. I'm just so. saying, I didn't mm -hmm. use it the way it's being used now. I used it very passively when I first did it. Right. I, I'm actually looking at it at a very basal level, a very basal how does your brain work level, and that's what concerns me for the young people. Um, grown ups can make their own decisions. But, but I think, you know, I think so, I think this board presents a unique question. <laughs> you know, I feel like there's this potential takeaway here that says, are we supposed to stop doing what we're doing? Um, so this district has invested a lot in technology devices and in technology people to support appropriate use of those devices that we, we do. We go out of belief that it enhances student learning. So I think in broad strokes, what you hear people saying tonight is there's this piece of engagement, right? So we talk about student engagement is we believe engaged students are higher achieving students. They learn more. Where they started and where they go from becomes a very complex question of engaging a child with a disability, engaging a child at the highest end of our continuum, and where they go over time. That's a question we look at every single day. Um, and then I think the opportunity to differentiate, right? So that this idea of putting tools in groups of children's hands and being able to do different things at the same time. It becomes a tool for teachers to kind of have more hands, more people in the room without having real people in the room, if that makes sense. So I, the things that strike me, um, but I think you're right, are the engagement and the differentiation. But this district has made a huge investment. So I don't want to walk away from tonight without sort of a, a better formulated either sort of a sense of the question of the full board. Um, because I, I'm looking at these people over here and I'm saying, like, are you saying stop doing what we're doing? Um, continuing to do what we're doing, but continue to balance and be very reflective and very thoughtful. And I think that's what you're hearing from this group tonight. Um, but I just I want to be clear because there's not a straightforward, easy answer to that question. And we all we all know that, right? So. I guess that's, that's where I would want the, the board to kind of weigh in on uh, further research on these questions. We're not paid researchers. We're paid practitioners, you know. Um, professional educators. Absolutely. And it's important for us to be as knowledgeable as we can. Absolutely. And I think that's what... Ignore the research, yeah. I think, is a detriment to the children. You can't say, oh, well, we don't know. And I think that is the point, that we don't know. And do you go along with something just because it might not be bad or because it works? And in just engagement and differentiation are not necessarily going to lead to, to achievement. I, I think, think they're going to contribute highly. I, maybe, yeah. you know, 
we have highly talented teachers also. Oh, absolutely. Who, who don't use technology wanna... in a balanced way. And I think that's yes. what we're trying to play. And out. my question still begs. Yeah, so I guess that's the Does question I would like for the full <laughs> board to consider because I, I'm not sure what the exactly think, formulated question is. That's what I, I just want yeah, to be clear. I don't know how many studies I can find to say, you know, there's some research out there about brain development. There's some research mm -hmm. out there about, you know, engaged learning. But I don't think because of the newness of technology, and I'll go back to what Don said, I think it's our due diligence to keep reading as much as we can. But like anything, I don't think anyone has a direct correlation on yet on what does it do for achievement over time because I do think the use of it has changed and the nature of it. Well, I'm reading changed. studies from this year and yeah. last year. No, I'm not I'm reading 20-year-old research. No, I know, but yeah. I'm saying in terms of what the usage was over time to get to that point. Understandable, but my question still remains is are we doing and focusing on things that are proven to work, like play and outdoor space time and, I would say and unstructured time? And I think we could make really great gains there. Yeah, I don't I think we give them enough time to reflect with their peers and to play without someone telling them how to work out a problem. And I hear what you're saying, so. and I, say, I would say that in what we presented tonight, I feel like we are doing a lot of you're asking us to do. That's, and that's actually what I'm hearing yeah. right now. Is that I, should we eliminate the little right. bit that we are yeah. doing? We haven't heard anything from, uh, from Joel and Dan and, and Rich. I don't know if you guys have anything to chime in here on this uh, topic. It, it, it's interesting for me to hear this, and I feel like a long timer on this board, but you know, three and a half years ago, the question was, well, you know, we have these devices, why aren't we integrating them more in the classroom? And we were challenging the administration to integrate them more. So now this, this conversation is evolving. I think I want to echo what Linda was just alluding to, is that it feels to me that um, it's not overtaking the classroom, that they're doing it in small bites. Um, and the question, I'm, I'm not going to say the question, the rabbit hole you threw us down <laughs> here, Jeff, which I think is the right context to, to ask the question. I don't know if we're going to get an answer to that right away. I mean, I think, um, I think it's the right question to continue asking. Same thing with you, Sherry. It's the right question to continue asking. But for if me, they ask for new devices, what do you do? It's a, for me, it's a question yeah. of scale. Right. Right? You're saying we this can't dominate education, Absolutely. and we're challenging, we're challenging the administration to keep it scaled and to keep it effective, mm -hmm. and not just turn our kids onto apps, but have them create things. Mm -hmm. That to me sounds like it's in the right context. Maybe I, I still I'm going to say this for the twentieth time. Um, does the process of creating something on the computer make it correlated to achievement? It could be argued that that's an achievement in itself. I mean, yeah. it's a qualitatively different Maybe. kind of thing. Maybe. I mean, that's that's what saying. I think and the, that's what I don't know, and I'd like to right. uh, show me. And I don't, know, I don't have research yeah. on what I'm about to say. I'll right. Admit that, right? right. But I think Tester. years ago, right, we would study for a test, give me my A, or let me, re like, right. let me take my test, and I move on. And some of us, two weeks later, could tell you <coughs> half the facts right. or more, right? right? If you did not have an unbelievable mind, memory, did we really learn that content or did we just cram to take the test and move on? Right. The goal as a tool, that is if we take information and we create something and we make edits along the way, not, not mistakes, but if we're making a podcast or we're making a movie or doing a PSA, like if we're doing something, right, can students remember what they've repeated and put into practice? I, I do not have research behind, that is my logic of what I find to be effective in technology. Can we get past basically saying to a student, you memorize great, you're going to get your A and you're going to move on, you did not remember that. Well, if all we're doing is memorizing, then I need to talk to Meryl about what we're doing in class. Right, but that's, no, and I know that I'm just, that's, saying, I'm just joking, historically. And, and yeah, I'm just joking, because right, I know but, we don't do that. Right, but you know. historically, right, That's that was part of learning, right? right? So the goal is the tool, the creation side, is that can we still take something? And you were saying, like, if, if you create something, can we prove that they're learning? That's my hope. My hope, right, is that by them creating something um, and using that information in a creative way, so we take information, let's say, on a topic in social studies, and we turn all that information into some sort of podcast, audio, something where mm -hmm. students can listen to it, they can record it. My hope is that they then, by repeating it, doing over and over, right. they're going to learn. 
and, and the goal totally is for get that. the I whole totally process to be academic like you're saying like mm -hmm. they are going to write a script for a movie and then they're going to revise it and edit it and I think they take more stock when they know the end product is going to be a movie because it is a little it increases the engagement level which I think increases the amount of time and effort they put into the academic component behind it again that is not research based but just I was a fifth grade classroom teacher same thing like when I had my kids do a shark tank presentation and videotape it their engagement level was way higher than when I made them write a five paragraph opinion essay I just saw the level of engagement of my own students way higher in the amount of effort and I think they mastered the standards in a way that I don't know if they would have mastered if I just had given them that strictly academic assignment and just with the iPads with the early learners we want them to still use unifix cubes to make number bonds mm -hmm. and then just snap a video of it and record their thoughts because like we agree, I agree with you 100% that like manipulating those things is so crucial to their mm -hmm. development um, but I think the, tr the tech is the tool is really just the end product but the whole component behind it is all academic. I, I realize I, I that I'm just so concerned about abstract thinking right. skills, which is kind of that higher higher order learning that we're so concerned about. So I'll I'll leave it at that. And um, I, mean, I guess if I can decide. maybe sort of because in, in healthcare we we deal a lot with this in healthcare. I mean, people come to say, oh, we need this, we need this new technology. I mean, there's been studies out there now showing that like alarms that go off in these electronic health records, people doctors are ignoring. And so it's like because they're getting so bombarded with it. So. I guess the, qu the, qu the question, I mean, to sort of to Martha's point, I mean, I don't think we should be throwing these iPads out. We don't. Right. I mean, we've, we've made a substantial investment. I'm not saying just because we made the substantial investment we should keep it, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that, techn again, technology is a tool, and so what are we trying to solve here, and how are we going to use the technology? I think what, but I don't think this, the, this group's, um, I know some, right. some you know, technology education, but I don't think it's this group's decision to That's do right. that. They're, I mean, they're still going to have to create the foundation, the wireless, the routers, the switches, Absolutely. and all that. I mean, I, I don't mean to be throwing this back to like that. Yeah, we're a team, though, instructionally, so yeah. I want to actually, Jason and Kelly and Don has a CNI background, too, so we all work together okay. on the instructional system. Right, and so I guess the, the thing is what I'm trying to say is that we need to, as, I, I think what needs to be done is how are we going to be using this technology and how are we going to enhance it um, and use the like the, the iPads, the Chromebooks, what have you, as a tool. I mean, we don't, it's like, what are we trying to solve here, and is, is the technology going to be the best mm -hmm. solution? I mean, and I guess what we've shared tonight are some of the examples. Right, and I think, right. right. So, so we're trying to keep that balance on right. what they, we tried to show you specifically the ways we're using it so and the balance of how we're trying to go about that, and I think we can keep asking the question. I don't think we're going to come to you, Sherry, and say, we want one-to-one -one brand new sets of iPads for all first grade classrooms. No, but we were asked for some for or well, very early that. learners, and that, that's kind of that. what concerned me to begin but with, was why they were asking that in the first place. Right, and I think in reviewing sort of the process that that request came through, Don and I talked about this, the request right. came before the research. Right, and, and that's all I'm asking is to make it thoughtful. The request. Right. And so when you know, when the early learner piece came forward, it was that, oh, there's there needs to be equity in sort of that program, mm -hmm. not really recognizing that they weren't going to use it that way, mm -hmm. right? right? That it would be nice to have it so that if they wanted to pull it out for a kid, mm -hmm. they'd have five of them, but the intent wasn't to all of a sudden have five kids on iPads mm -hmm. right, for 20 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. So when you really looked at the usage, that need to have five mm -hmm. iPads in an early learner right. classroom, which you know, we put it up there. It wasn't really what that request was about. So I do think. Yeah, we need to think about that process. Yeah. Correct. I'm kind of curious to, to hear what uh, Dan and, and, and Joel think. Dan, you, you're on the tech steering committee. You might have uh, some some thoughts on this issue. I don't know you, what you. Uh... I'm, I'm very intrigued by the the study Sherry was mentioned. I would like to find out more I'll about it. Um, I, in, yeah. in terms of my own you know, kids' experience or from you know, what I see, I, I don't think that what I see is uh, the use of technology. I don't see it as, as uh, overarching or the overall theme of, of no. education. I see, I see. I, I hear a lot of uh, what was said about engagement. I definitely would agree with that, and I've seen that with Veronica. She loves making videos about this, that, and everything. Um, and I can see a lot of positive benefits from that. 
But again, that is an intriguing study that you mentioned. I would, uh, would like to hear more about that. I totally agree with you. They love it. They get excited. They start talking. I, I don't deny that. I don't. So that's interesting. Uh, Joel, what are your, do you have any thoughts on the topic? Or just I, sure I have a say, or? certain doubt about how far societally we've gone down this technology rabbit hole where it's kind of enshrined as something godlike, if you will. But everything that I'm hearing from Don and Kelly and Jason is it, it heartens me because you're vetting what the kids are looking at. You're trying to validate whether or not it has a use and a role beyond just paper on a screen. Mm -hmm. um, I, that, I think that is where I want you to be at, where we're, we're making sure it's good use of a tool. Um, I think some of the older kids may need more of that supervision where they're not just looking online to find some information and they're just, and I've watched it in my own daughter. Quick copy paste, let's put the information in the paper, it gets what the teacher wants. And so I may actually have a different concern on more towards the older kids where they don't know how to use it as well. And they're not being creative, they're just copying and they're trying to find the quick fix. Um, that, that's really, I think you're doing good things with the, the younger kids, but the older kids I don't think, partially because they're, they're a tougher group to deal with in terms of their desired independence, but they may need more supervision and vetting, and the teachers themselves may need to be more, have more encouragement for better use, if that makes sense. <clears throat> and I think that really ties in with that is there's a lot of professional development that, that, that really ties into he really showing teachers and, and Jason and Kelly have been doing an excellent job of, of working with teachers to use it beyond the substitution level you know it's it is that SAMR model of of uh, a, of, uh, of going into more of the, the creation aspects uh, of the use of technology and really transforming the um, the, the, the lesson or the activity as opposed to it, it it being more of that something that they might have just done by you know writing something down that they saw online or out of an encyclopedia uh, so that is the continued professional development of staff uh, that that we continue to do um, and with Jason and Kelly's role of, of, of really being uh, uh, you know the boots on the ground working with 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 staff uh, the, 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 uh, the Google boot camps and, and how many people, how many teachers are, what were last year? Uh, four, four, four. <clears throat> I okay. have heard nothing from the, you know, but good things from right. the teachers and just being on committees. They love when you come in and help. They love learning from you. So, and just random people will say, oh, I did this, you know, yeah. and it was so and much fun. And I know, you know, rarely do you say, like, teachers say, oh, that was fun that I learned about the tech yeah. things. So <clears throat> you do yeah. an amazing job working with them. Yeah, and, and so, so that's that evolution of continuing to to uh, work with, with staff and move them along in the process. Because with, you know, technology is new and with a lot of our staff, it, it's, it's, it's really new relative to their, the amount of time that they have been teaching. Where you know, They may have been teaching for, for 25 years and it's been the last five to 10 years where it's, it, it's, technology's really come on the scene. And so it's a change in, 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 in how they operate their classroom. And Jason and Kelly do an excellent job at, at, at supporting that. Also to Mr. Google's point though, um, some of the standards that we're talking about for the, the he talked about the ISTE standards and talking to the teachers about the expectations. That's also part of that, you know, how are you holding kids accountable for what they're doing in terms of the product and what is developmentally needs to go in at each grade level and having increasing for the sake of a product is not our goal. So that would, and I that would come through. Didn't think it was, <laughs> nor am I, nor am I, <laughs> nor, nor am I state, yeah. It's, it's the supervision and the accountability that I think you're, show, you're telling me and showing me that you're doing it well. But I think there's aspects where we need to explore. <coughs> always, always room for improvement. Oh. And yeah. Continuous improvement. <laughs> and, you know, and, 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 and as, as teachers move along, um, you know, we have 
we have two, two, uh, two staff that are that are focused on those teachers. The you know, and then staff also have their different levels of interest and engagement and wanting to to learn. But but the more that we move people on the front and middle and where they get extremely comfortable and they see the benefits, uh, then they can focus on, you know, again, con continuing focus on time on, on everyone, but, but, but especially those who maybe need a little bit more assistance. Can, can I just say a few words? I didn't feel like I got I'm to sorry, say. I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, I, what I wanted to say was that I feel like what you presented tonight is a very balanced and moderate and reflective approach to where we were six years ago. Everybody should have a one on one. Let's get it. Let's, you know, we didn't really know how it was being used in the classroom. And we've now gotten to the point where we'll be able to, to really decide how instructionally these tools are affecting, you know, are going to help our children's education. So I really feel like we've gotten to a point and we're really talking a lot about what Sherry's talk, like what she brings in is something you guys are going to think about and reflect on. And, uh, and it's great that we're at this point because. You know, with technology moving so fast, we're not always there. So I, I just want to say I'm very impressed with the um, just the the moderation. I mean, you could just do everything right here, and we don't do that. Um, I'm also really impressed with like the things I've heard just from my own students who come home and say like, my eighth grader came home the other day and said, I didn't understand what a symbol in reading was until we listened to a chapter out loud and we slowed it down and we and like we were able to pause it as we're all on the same page to say like, do you understand like in To Kill a Mockingbird what this symbolizes? And he's like, it never dawned, he's like, I always knew what they were talking about, but it never dawned on me until we were just listening to it in a slow, methodical, like deliberate fashion. You know, that's a great use of technology. Or my, my other son who just, you know, he's, he's uh, English and writing are not his strong suit. So when he's doing a math problem, he can't write out why he got what he got, but he can say it and record it and remember that. So there, there's a lot of strong reasons like technology is incorporated, and I think um, we can go too far and do it, incorporate it too much, or we can do a really balanced, moderate approach. And I'm appreciative that we're having the conversation about it, and that we're being informed that like we're not just using technology just for the sake of technology. Um, I, I completely understand. You know, I'd love to read the the study yeah, Sherry's talking I'll about. Send it. I'll send it. Yeah. I'll send it. You know, yeah, I will. And I, and I get it. And I, I'm a reader. You know, and I think. Um, Kids are still doing all of those other things as well. It's not like they're just doing that. So I, I just wanted to just put in where, where I, I And I agree with what Linda's saying. I think you guys are really thoughtful about it. I like the fact that you yourself are skeptic, somewhat skeptical of uh, technology in your home yeah. life. Yeah. 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 That, that, that encouraged me. I am as well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even though I, I like technology, I still, with my kids, I I, I yeah, they, they have it, but um, no. But, um, but uh, I, I agree with what uh, people are saying here, and I think may, maybe um, to answer uh, sort of Martha's question, like you know, where where are we going from here? I don't know. Maybe if the board maybe um, would agree with the statement, like you had a, a plan, a five-year plan, you had a bunch of things you want to look at, you want to look at uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. M maybe when we're looking at those things, may maybe the what we should sort of think about is like, what is the evidence? We're going to go out and buy this. So we, you know, what is the evidence that this is actually going to do? Something that's beneficial, and really take a close look at that. You know, I'm which I'm sure you'll do. Definitely. Um, but uh, maybe that's. Yes, the vendors. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure they'll have the answer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, they, they, so oh, I'm sure they will. If there's <laughs> nothing, <laughs> anything else for the, the trio, I think they've done an amazing job being patient and answering all, right. all of our questions. I, I have a very anticlimactic question. <laughs> <laughs> This is something actually I should have asked at the Technology Steering Committee, but I didn't get it until uh, just after I got home. And, and uh, my wife was writing out a check, and she said, the only time I write checks anymore are for District 96. Oh. And I thought, oh, that, that's an aha there. And I do wonder, <laughs> over the next five years, do we have that in the roadmap Have we ever thought about uh, online payments and online processing because if we get to five years out I yes, wonder it's, about where we're at. Actually, um, you know, we have that we, we, we hired this new uh, uh, director of finance. Uh, <laughs> but we've actually we've had that conversation. Um, it was a topic that uh, began researching last year um, but wanted to wait until uh, Rob was on board. Uh, we actually do have, uh, I think it's next Thursday or is it late? I think, it's, I think it's next Thursday we have a, a meeting with a company <laughs> called RevTrack. They, they, they really handle, I think, the, the bulk of uh, those type of online fee payments uh, uh, systems for school districts. 
So yeah, definitely that's a, that's an avenue we want to go. Um, yeah, into 21st century uh, uh, finance collection too. So yeah, is that, is that what, what do most districts do now? Are they they use Repco. <laughs> 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 I was going to say are we the only ones, right? Yeah. Okay, um, Meryl. Yeah. So maybe we'll move on to outdoor play and I do want to thank the policy committee for their extra time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're more than welcome. <laughs> thank you, guys. There's more I forgot. Ah, uh, very anticlimactic. Uh, yours is much better. <laughs> it was it was an aha moment as soon as I got it. Put the mic down. This is like um, America's Got Talent. I need the mic down here. Oh. Okay, while we might not spend as much time on this topic tonight, it's probably more important than the one we just talked about. So the number of slides should not reflect its importance in the scheme of things. Um, but we wanted to talk a little bit about where we are with the whole child, social emotional learning and physical well-being. Um, and as Sherry was talking about research around social play, she's absolutely right. There is a lot, a huge body of research that talks about social play and the benefits of unstructured time. And also, Jeff, you mentioned the benefits of being outdoors and, and in the natural world. And we know that all of those things do enhance student learning and there are correlations around that in terms of when you can lower the intensity around the rigor of a school experience and give some kids some downtime to reflect that that does enhance in fact what they're doing in school so oh that white didn't translate well um, up here it did better on the screen than it does on the larger screen but you have it in your packets too um, it looks good on the computer it just doesn't look good up there um, yeah it looks better on there um, so anyway one of the things we wanted to talk about is that um, we do have some things in place relative to how we're providing opportunities for kids and some of those assets and so I'll summarize them since you can't see really well is that our community at large does value and celebrate the idea that outdoor space and the environment can enhance learning opportunities for kids. We wish we had more opportunities and we were talking about that in our long range facility plan around how we might enhance those, those areas around our schools so we can provide more of that. Um, we do have uh, physical movement breaks in K through five daily. Two times a week, those are through regular physical education classes and the other three times they're through what are called teacher directed PE breaks and movement breaks. Um, and at K through five, there's still daily recess in place. At Hauser, there is daily PE, which a lot of middle schools can't say, so we're glad we're still maintaining that. And that also they've incorporated some downtime in advisories um, through the Cougar Connection program. And that, that has really given some kids more choices in terms of how they're kind of de-escalating during the day for a short period of time to give them a break. We also know that we have some challenges. One of them I mentioned was facility space and access to outdoor play and size of our gymnasiums, things like that. Um, some of the open spaces in our community are of concern from a safety perspective. They're not they're not isolated from traffic. They're in places where there's traffic patterns, especially those that, that are accessible to our school sites. And then we also know the Hauser schedule presents some challenges in creating some of those additional opportunities. So as we look forward in the long range facility plan, one of the things that you need to know is legislation is changing around the daily PE requirements. There, the former legislation was that you were required to have it five days per week, and if you didn't, then you had to have some balance of the physical activity that you could point to on paper. Um, that has changed, and it's it, the new legislation is saying three times per week. So we actually stepped, amped up our daily PE through our teacher-directed PE, which was in place a few years ago and sort of revisited last year and this year to make sure we were instituting it well and with accountability so that we would not need to file for a waiver in the future around PE, even if the legislation had not changed. We're in a position now where we're in <coughs> compliance. So with the three-day requirement, we'll definitely be in compliance. And we're not looking to, at this point, reduce any of that time just because the legislation is changing. But I did want to point out that you will hear that it is changing. So we will not be required to file a waiver with respect to PE for 
next year after it expires. So as we look at the long-term facility planning, we do want to look at um, potential opportunities for improvement. Like how can we gain more access to outdoor space, outdoor learning spaces, as well as outdoor physical sp play spaces. Um, just today, d Mrs. Ryan Toy, Martha has forwarded this Green Schools Initiative that was shared with her um, about some of the Chicago public school settings where they're looking at these things and she's gonna forward that to our architect as well. Just looking creatively, um, and how we can do those things. And I know the facility committee is talking about that. Um, also considering maybe some large group instructional spaces that are within our building so that if we have a larger space, we can actually use it to engage in physical team building activities with two classes at a time or even one class if you have set that space to move around in to be able to do some of those kinds of social emotional learning initiatives. And then re-examining the Hauser schedule is something that we're constantly talking about and refining and tweaking and revising. As those of us that are, have been, been here in the last couple of years, we've made some minor adjustments along the way. And we think as we look forward, we're gonna continue to look for ways that we can continue to expand those unstructured opportunities for students, because we do know there is benefit to those. Um, so we don't have a lot of answers. That, tonight obviously we're headed into a planning process but we do have a lot of questions and we are keeping those on the forefront in terms of how we continue to enhance these opportunities so this is um, what our current reality is um, kindergarten in the half day program has one physical education period a week and then daily 15 minute movement breaks um, with their teachers first through fifth two times per week physical education and three times per week 15 to 30 I put 15 as a minimum. In most cases, it's been 25 to 30 um, as far as that movement break. 15 is what the minimum requirement is in code, but we go beyond that. Um, sixth through eighth grade, we have the daily 40 minute PE and then the Cougar Connection, um, two times, for one time team building, one time choice time. So that's our current reality in terms of where we're at. So it is something that's on our minds and because it was spoken um, about within the previous presentation, it's nice that we have this follow-up to say, yes, this is something that we still value and is important to us as a district. Uh, I was at a P the PLT meeting last week, and I know uh, we were talking about a lot of this kind of stuff, and um, I know, well, I'll speak for myself. Can, sometimes the concern, like there's unstructured time and lunch, which is supposed to feel like un unstructured time, doesn't always feel like unstructured time, and I'm just curious if as you're starting this process, if you're gonna look at how lunch is. That's know. on the radar too. In fact, we were talking about how Mr. Jones did uh, a survey of kids as part of one of his design experiments to talk about lunch and how kids feel about lunch. And as you can imagine with middle schoolers, there's a variety of perspectives. Right. If it's working for kids, they like it. If it's not, not working for they kids, don't. they don't. <laughs> right. um, but we certainly need to continue to look at that. We have all 200 students per grade level eating at one time. Right. And that's one right. of the things that the administration, we just had a conversation today. If we could split that in half, like how much more pleasant could that experience be right. for all kids if the group just even in that setting was smaller. The manageability, the access to the food, the amount of time they would have to move through their lunch periods. So again, the facility constraints are causing some of that. Sharing with Central right now is one of those factors that creates some of that. But yes, that's definitely something Good. else that's within that just conversation. Just wanted to bring it up because it was definitely yep. a I think it's covered by my conversation, but it was definitely a conversation. Yeah, we, we talked about it because I actually, it's one of those things that's coming at, from a lot of different angles. So, yeah. you know, one of, I think, our advantages is to get to hear a lot of different perspectives. It's parents and students and teachers, and, mm -hmm. you know, and we're hearing that this is something that, that needs, you know, Attention. further analysis. And they're, I don't think it's necessarily an easy problem to solve because we know it interrelates very much with our facilities. Um, but we're also hearing that, I think, loud and clear from the community around the survey that we looked at is that, you know, outdoor, playtime, is important. And facility enhancements to make things yeah. manageable. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, one of the, the manageability. It all goes. Who knows this better than anybody. We yeah. can get those kids moving mm -hmm. in at a different time or. Yeah. yeah. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a bad way. No. Yeah. Not in a bad way. But yeah, it it's is. complex. <laughs> it just is. Yeah. So some of those intersections, yeah, I, I would love to keep having those conversations about how we alleviate some of the conflicts that are creating some of the challenges. Yeah, I'm really. 
-hmm. comes forth with. Mm -hmm. And thank you for saying the green initiatives piece, Martha. Yeah, and I will, I'll, I'll yeah. share that with all of you. I just got that from a parent this afternoon. Thanks. It was a parent who was at the parent leadership team meeting. Because yeah. Yeah. they must, I'm sure they have the same problem as yeah. we do because we're landlocked. Yeah. Right. I think this is a very, very important topic. I'm glad you guys are looking mm -hmm. at it. Um, well, how much time can we make in our schedule, like say for the elementary kids? I mean, uh, so, for, for recess and, and, and lunch and more a more relaxed experience of lunch. I know right now at lunch it's sort of like a little bit uh, very regimented in a way, I think, in some ways at Central, I know. Um, I don't know it's the only one I know of. Um, it's very short. But how much time can we, like, the elementary we get out of our schedule? Yeah, the uh, elementaries what? have a full 50-minute period right now. So they have 25 for lunch and 25 for recess. There's yeah. probably about a five minute transition in there that impacts okay. that back and so that's, forth. That's an, this is an addition to that to that 25 Cor minutes. And, yeah. and Correct. Lunch. Okay. Correct. Kind of the, under that PE. Yeah. Type. So I didn't put daily. I didn't put the daily recess. I, you know, we have daily recess at K, at one through five that is attached to lunch. That is attached to lunch. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that's also an opportunity there. Could we expand this? I think the way you expand access to outdoors is maybe not through 100% downtime. And we do have a lot when you have PE in there as as we do. Um, some of it is just even getting outside for learning experiences. Yeah, that are enhancing. You know, using Blythe put in that new garden, so they're taking the kids out and having some of that fresh air as they're talking about the plants, the native plants that they planted and some of their science pieces. So I think it's a combination of both physical and unstructured time, but also just access to outdoor environment for enhancing that learning as well. I think it's a combination of things. I mean, we do have instructional minutes that we have to meet with respect to the you know, state expectations on a weekly basis. And you know, our school day is our school so, day. So that was my question. Kind of, yeah. so if you look at the man mandated instructional minutes, like how many minutes? There's not a lot of minutes that we can squeak out further are, to. How left after to, you add up all the mandated, do you know? I mean, um, that conversation well, yeah, today. when we looked at about 30 minutes yeah. a week when you're looking at it, there's not daily minutes left over. Because okay. again, it's, it's on how a, a specialist schedule falls out versus, but on an average in a week, if we took all our allocated minutes out, it's about 30 minutes a week that there's flex time in there um, that's truly not associated with a content area. That's mandated by the state. Basically. Correct. Correct. If you look at, we're sort, we sort of take science and social studies and um, we flip flop them. So we do 150 minutes a week, but sometimes it's, right. It's combined. Yeah. Right. Right. So you're kind of block scheduling? Well, we flip it, so we'll do like, a, sometimes they'll do like You're two, double blocking correct, it, so you do and, a full lesson on the science, yeah. smart in a science perspective way. To keep, it con to keep that continuity, rather than trying to do 25 minutes of science and 25 <coughs> minutes of social <coughs> studies. That right. work. Yeah. Um, there's also opportunity, though, Dr. Miller, to respond to your question, to look more interdisciplinary at some of what we're doing as we address the new standards in science and social studies at elementary, which could then free up time in our schedule to provide additional downtime. So if we're integrating and covering the standards within an ELA block, it does it, the minutes become combined. So right. within that block, you're covering science and ELA combined. You can allocate them toward both subjects. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are some of the things that we're sort of exploring, like how can we work mm -hmm. more intuitively and in an interdisciplinary way to free up some schedule time. So on, on Hauser, you mentioned the Hauser schedule. Yeah. Um, are you, have you any thoughts about that and what you're thinking about in terms of that schedule? Well, I don't, we haven't flushed out any details because uh -huh. some of it is having to really take it all apart and look at what the FTE implications are. So the initial conversations in April, Christy and I just talked about this this morning, actually, because we meet at the first Wednesday of every month. We talked about, like, if we were to analyze, like, like, for example, you've asked about the math block before, and if we analyze, could we do it in 60 and still get the benefits of the instruction and have that extra 20, and could we tag it on? The reality of adjusting a middle school schedule to do that would imply that we'd have to have the right number of teachers at each grade level, and the teachers may not be able to share grade levels anymore, and your FTE may go up. So there's implications for any of those kinds of adjustments. So what they're doing right now is they're outlining all the conditions that would be impacted if they wanted to move to something where they were opening up some of those opportunities. 
So that's what we're in the process of outlining right now. So I'd say we're taking initial steps around that to when look you at say some. They can't share grade levels. Can you expound on that? Within the scheduled block, so if you're changing blocks around and your times and your bell times are different for every grade level and you're, you have a teacher that teaches 7th grade math and 8th grade math, but you're working off different 40, 60, 80s, mm -hmm. then you can't align them to necessarily be able to cover both grade levels. Yeah. So that becomes a scheduling problem. Mm -hmm. so, so then it takes more teachers and then you may have to try to look at shared disciplines and who's certified in what to try to be sure you can cover the FTE if you were creating a schedule like that. So I asked them to flush it out with one grade level, flush out some, some adjusted schedules. And I'm not saying 60 minutes of math is the thing that they would do, but to flush out different models of scheduling and what it would take you know, if we were to create more of a recess block on a grade level. And, and what, it, what would be the implications for our school day? Would we need to look at lengthening a school day to still get in our instructional I think it was just, so two years ago, just before April started as principal, there had been recess in the schedule that had been removed. Okay. So that was, it was just two or three years. It was a very short It was when the ago. Encore got added and Band and Orchestra went back into the schedule. Yes. Yes. When it used to be outside of the school day. Yeah. So that kind of created that. It was mm -hmm. um, three years ago. Three right. years ago. And it was the impetus of moving that in that created an Encore block that then took away time from so I think it's, of course, looking at a schedule that's built for optimizing student learning, and that's fitting in all our priorities. And I think that's it's a challenge. That's the that sort of is represented in this conversation tonight. Is there are a lot of priorities? And the, the reason we were kind of picking apart the elementary schedule this morning was to think about foreign language. You know, so again, we, I, I think that's these are really important conversations for the the board to continue to think about and focus on and um, establish those priorities as we move forward. So just speaking of the encore, that change that, that you were just referring to with the recess and the adding the uh, adding the uh, band orchestra during the day and, and those cha changes of that nature. I mean, are you revisiting that whole thing? Like, was that were that were those decisions ultimately good decisions? I mean, that, those are those yeah. Are so we surveyed parents last year, if you recall, around the band and orchestra moving into the school day, and the surveys came back that parents preferred it mm -hmm. in the school day. Now that they were able to compare it within and outside of. Um, are the kids getting a lot more instructional time in their instruments? Yes. <laughs> Is the performance improving in terms of the number of students in IMEA and those? Yes. But they're getting a lot more time than they had when it was outside of the school day. So I would expect that. So again, it's the priority piece. Like this morning, the conversation around elementary with foreign language was, well, can we take the teacher-directed PE minutes and put them into foreign language? But don't we value teacher-directed PE because the kids are moving and not structured? And so, you know, again, we're going to have to make some decisions as an organization around where we want to sink our priorities right. be, because there's only so many minutes in the day. Right. So. Yeah, lots of questions there. How early do they go? And right, they exactly. Very early for exactly. orchestra, and is that good for them too? I Yeah, the middle schooler's getting up to be here at 7. Right, and right. It's not right. so good for them. So, yeah. Well, yeah. thank you for piecing it sure. apart. Um, and I think what we're going to yeah. end up, I mean, similar to what Don was, Tafano was yeah. describing with technology, I think we have to weigh out different models and different scenarios to say what is going to best meet the needs of this board in terms of their priorities and what we know is best for our students in terms of practices and right. make some of those decisions. They're not easy decisions, none of them are, but you know, we will make them and we will figure it out just to keep meeting the needs of our students. The scenarios? Right. I think that'd be really interesting to see for your, <laughs> yeah. you know, just the creativity of uh, moving things around. Yeah, right. and so that's what I've challenged, sort of charged the middle school administration team, administrative team with, is to put some things on paper and see what that actual real, real live implication is. <laughs> Around. And I know there are a few pieces in the legislation that just came out that are, are there any pending that we're waiting to find out about or is that um, not that, that affect I mean, what we're talking about? Yeah, no, like the PE three times a week is a done deal. It's That's just done. a matter of okay. how they're going to write the interpretation okay. for schools. And I think th what I'm hearing is there's a hesitancy among superintendent groups, I know, to, to Change modify anything. that greatly, yeah. particularly high school, middle school, where it's really, again, really built into the, yeah. the school day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
crazy. Right, and why? And, and why? Yeah. The, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so well, like I said, on the front end, I mean, we value it was, that. It was difficult for so many districts to implement, I yeah. think, was the reason. Yeah. They just had There's no so space many to do it. So districts everyone's with getting waivers. a waiver because of space. Right. You know? Yeah. People couldn't make, jump the hoop that they had created, so now they're redefining the hoop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also. Any other questions for Meryl? Okay, so the only other thing I wanted to mention was in your packet, you also had um, a memo on the Advanced Learning Committee and, their, and the update on where we're at with that. So I mentioned in that memo that we had a meeting on the 19th and we are in the visioning process of, of a model. And we spent a lot of time this summer taking the research that we had gone through last year and looking at different scenarios for models that are out there in the gifted world, gifted and advanced learning world and looking at the elements of those in conjunction with the vision and mission that statement that was created for our students and then the parameters from the best practices and then the stakeholder feedback. So we took all of those things and had people look at models in relationship to those elements and then we um, processed some scenarios, some potential scenarios that might align with the feedback we got from the various models people looked at and we're in the visioning stage. So now we're taking the feedback from the committee from that day, and we're gonna to try to vision a propo an actual proposed model in our next committee meeting and work through the nuances of that, trying to take into consideration all the feedback that we've gotten so far. That next meeting is November 3rd. Um, and Mrs. Cliver said it best, I think at the committee, we have self-imposed our time limit to get to you by spring, but if we're working through this process and feel like we need more time to reflect and be thoughtful, then we may come back and ask for that. But we're hoping that we can work through at least the model phase um, by winter. So we'll see where that leads after the next committee meeting. But it's been a really thoughtful, reflective group, lots of great um, insights and conversations. Um, and really the ideas are flexibility, creativity, maximizing opportunities for students, and really looking at that potential and developing that potential in all our students, but then how do we push those kids that are at that higher level? So. And just to add, like we, we have different talks about elementary than we do for middle school, obviously. There are different considerations with math and English that the teachers have brought up um, that are going to need a different, perhaps even a different model in the way that we approach it because their pieces are so differently right. taught. So. Um, a lot of questions. And the ability, the one, the one I think wonderful thing we did here is that the new core curricular materials that they have K through eight is allowing teachers to meet more students' needs than they could before on both ends, on all ends, and having the resources to really stretch students even in the general ed setting or support students in the general ed setting. Now that they have some identified core content, they're able, they have them at their fingertips and they're able to on the spot respond to a student who might need something that's somewhat of a push or somewhat of a support. So that was nice to hear in the context of that meeting as we were working. Um, and then the only other item in your packet from the Education Committee was a list of potential topics. We always like to provide that skeleton so it gives us some focus. Of course, if there's something that becomes timely, time sensitive or you know is a burning topic or a hot topic that we need to bring forward we'll make those adjustments as we move through the school year yeah and please reach out like sometimes that you guys will write me something or ask or call please refill your call and i'll pass Hi. it on to merrill um this is kind of based on past practice but also on what's currently happening in our committees and right. our strategic plan is kind of the scaffold so if there's something you're like oh i i thought we were going to hear about such and such please uh, it's a working document shout like out yeah it. So thank document. you very much. You have a lot of plates spinning. So mm -hmm. awesome. try to keep them in there. Well, well done. <laughs> and thank you for the support and the board and all that. you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. She's a very busy woman, and we appreciate everything she's organizing for us. That's all we have. All right, thanks, Ray. Uh, I have nothing to report at this time. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I was waiting for 30 That's more. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so with that said, um, we took your time. Future meeting dates are October 18th, 2017. Uh, meeting will be at 7 o'clock, uh, closed session at 6.30. Um, November 1st, uh, committee the whole meeting, 7 p.m. in Hollywood. Um, and then November 15th, uh, regular business meeting, uh, 6.30. The public session part will start at 7 p.m. Uh, so is there any further business, uh, business to anyone who would like to discuss? If not, then the meeting is adjourned.